So first of all, thank you, uh, Susan and the library team for organizing the presentation. But the biggest thank you goes to my EMI team. Uh, we have here Judith Lopez. Jennifer is not here. Jennifer Holly Lehman and also Daniel Dos Anjos. The three of them have to do a lot with the book and much more so even with the EMI reports. Also the rest of the EMI team, Vinita Pachava, a newcomer, Claudia, who has just uh, said yes to be part of the EMI team. She doesn't know what it, what it entails, but a lot of work. And also Mumuksha Kichek, who is here, and Vinita Pachava, many of them uh, are uh, definitely authors, co-authors of this tremendous effort of EMI. With very little resources, we have uh, done uh, quite a bit. So uh, let me just show you the reports that, as Susan says, are available for free in e-commerce in the library. So when I took over the institute, I thought that the institute needed a voice and my expertise was on emerging multinationals. So companies from emerging markets that expand all over the world, from India, Brazil, Korea, and mainly China. So with my co-author, Anne Miru, who was the former director of um, logistics and innovation at UNCTAD, at the United Nations Committee on Trade and Development, we started uh, producing these reports in collaboration with the OECD Development Center in a group of researchers from all over the world. In the last report, actually, we have a scholar from Wuhan University. We have been in contact with her. She has just sent us two videos directly from Wuhan, and she's optimistic that the current crisis will finish soon. Just to give you an example, not only Wuhan University have collaborated, but also Guenzo University, Tecnológico de Monterrey, Universidad de los Andes in Colombia, and University of Sao Paulo. So thanks to this collaboration of all these schools, we try to make sense of the changes in power all over the world, but mainly the role of these new multinationals from emerging markets. So today, so as a result of the four reports, we have produced this book, because as I said, which companies have gained the most have been Chinese companies. So, A uh, spe special welcome to Professor Gustavo Flores Macias. We are co-teaching a class on current issues in this spring semester. The class is sold out. So even if you're interested, you cannot join, sorry. <laughs> but yes, uh, as you know, there is a lot happening in the world and uh, Gustavo and I have been trying to make sense, preparing the, the course and looking forward to a very interesting class. So thank you, Gustavo, for coming. And he was actually here two weeks ago with his presenting his book. So this is the, 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 as I said, okay, let's see. No, it's not moving the slides. Yeah, okay. Okay, no? Is in there? Okay, no? It's okay, we have the, we have the slides. Uh, we have, you all have a printout? Thank you. Ah, okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. So as I said, the titles of these uh, four reports, one was the China search. So there was something that surprised all of us, how these companies are growing from China. The, the other one was, so we put the title of the report the same as the EMI conference that is in November. So it's a theme for the whole year. So it's emerging multinationals in a changing world, then reshaping globalization. It was right after President Trump came to power. And I remember being at Davos and President Xi came and said, we are going to be the champions of globalization. So like saying from emerging markets, we will lead this new phase of globalization. Then a constructive engagement. So again, the, the, the situation is very polarized. So we take a stand that we say we need to build bridges and encouraging dialogue. And that it was the theme of the, the overall theme of the report. Okay. Okay, so this year's report, as I said before, has um, two, three themes. We always check 
how the, uh, these companies are doing in the global 500 of Fortune. Then we had also chapters on China's influence on the business side in Latin America and in Africa. And then uh, the global south, how Chinese investments yeah, are, uh, and then revisiting also. So another thing we have done in the reports we call E20. So we focus on the biggest emerging markets and we call them E20. We give this name. And here are the uh, collaborations this year. And as I said, uh, OECD Development Center that we're looking at how the role of the Sustainable de Development Goals, another on Korean multinationals, social innovation, Mexican multinationals, and state capitalism from our colleague uh, Chen Limin from Wuhan University. So another thing we realized is that the situation in China is changing so fast that yes, there were a few books, but outdated. Every year, the situation changes radically. Things are going very fast. And we thought that it was time to write another one. OK, so then I'm going to talk about these five themes. We have like 40 minutes, you said, Susan, about 40 minutes and another 20 minutes of Q&A. So the first thing was, was a surprise for us, is how fast the change was. So I'm going to talk mainly about multinationals. But before that, I just wanted to give you a little bit of the context in which these companies have grown. So all companies all over the world, all over the world grow with the growth of the economy of the country. So everybody has spoken many times about how fast the economy in China has grown. And now the glass is half empty or half full. I would say it's half full. China is still growing at 6%. To give you a comparison, today's Chinese economy is the size of the US economy in 2004. Not yet financial crisis. In 2004, it was a booming year. And that year, the economy of the US grew 3.4%. So I'm going to tell you one thing for sure. The Chinese economy cannot grow that fast because we have never seen in the economic history an economy growing of the size of China, and I gave you the example of the US, growing at that rapid growth. So it's really impossible because it's so such a huge economy, no, economies grow at a little bit slower pace. Second thing that has happened, this tremendous revolution, and that is President Trump always points to that, is how China has positioned itself as the most important trading, trading nation in the world. If you add exports, and imports, they, they are number one, very close, followed by the US. And then this mismatch, while China and the European Union, for instance, are able to balance their trade, US has a tremendous deficit. Mainly, US has a deficit with all countries in the world, I think except the UK. With all countries, the trade has a deficit, but the deficit with, the, with China is very big. So Chinese companies have grown because the economy has grown, because the scale of their, their domestic economy, in, and because the capacity to absorb knowledge. And also because the government, unlike other developing countries, the government has supported OFDI, has said, you know what? Only attracting FDI, as Latin America has done, only doing that is not enough. Uh, countries very early on need to support their OFDI. So we compared here three years, and then again, this is a, a slide done by Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. So we compare in red is what we call emerging markets, E20, and we also consider Russia as E20. It's a little bit controversial, but we consider that in Korea as well. So we see that in 2000, and the first one is 2004, I think, 2000, sorry, in 2000, no red. This game of investing abroad is a game of big companies, big, uh, big countries, big, con big developed countries. 2010, you start seeing China position itself number four, Russia and Korea. So the three countries, mainly the Russia after President Putin went to power, have in the government has encouraged actively to their national champions and the expansion of the national champions. Now, China is number two. 
Strangely enough, in 2018, so last, last year that we have data, the 2019 data has not come, US does not appear for a very special reason because that year, US uh, and the, the President Trump, the government, encouraged repatriation of profits. So that year, what happened is that US companies repatriated more than they invested abroad. So that's why it's not part of the, of the ranking, but probably this year, as it's always been, will be number one or number two, and maybe China a little bit less because China is now saying, China is facing headwinds in the investments abroad. So as a result, and that's what is shocking, and this has been in the news a lot this last year, in the global 500 of fortune, we see how the number of Chinese companies has grown to 119 this last year, 2000, end of 2018. Yeah, end of 2018. So another thing that is very telling in this, uh, in this uh, graph is when the inflection point was, I'm going to do cold calling, Charlotte, you are too close to me. When this thing changed, when, this, when do you see the growth of, a emerging, of emerging companies from China? When do you see that the trend changes? When it starts, which year? Well, uh, no, no, another one also? Yeah, sorry, yeah, we have to use the microphone. Who wants to say another year? Yevan, the behind. Um, which year do you see the change? The 2013. Yeah, also, yeah, mainly one. I wanted you to see. Any event in those years that was very important for the expansion of Chinese companies? Yes, exactly. The financial crisis. So there are two milestones. <clears throat> Everybody mentions the milestone of China accession in the World Trade Organization in 2001. But there is another equally important milestone that is the global financial crisis. US companies suffer, European companies as well, or a little bit later, and then it was a golden opportunity for Chinese companies to expand, to acquire many companies all over the world. And that's the, um, the, the, the springboard for China to go, yeah, 2013-14, very important as well, but mainly is 2008. So China has joined a club, an exclusive club. So there are 200 countries and territories in the world. So only 17 have more than one big company, okay? Another disclaimer, I believe that big companies are very important for any economy because they are source of employment, innovation, knowledge, and also they pull the small and medium-sized companies. And actually, one of the reasons why Latin America has a disproportionate lower number of big companies uh, also affects the fact that small and medium-sized companies in, in Latin America do not grow. And there is a, a World Bank st study about 10 years ago saying that. So we have here China, an outlier, clearly. Korea, another outlier, a small economy, and still so many big companies. Brazil, not doing that bad, not enough, but not doing that bad. Then India, doing okay as well. Russia, Mexico, and Saudi Arabia. Again, Saudi Arabia is an emerging market. We put it here. And then we have all these other countries, red emerging markets with one company in the global 500. So very few countries have, okay, so 21, have uh, more than one company in the global 500. So another very important, again, Daniel, thank you for the graph. Uh, another very important milestone is not only, okay, before I do this one, can I go back? Yeah. Okay, before I do one, another cold calling. Vinit, you are in finance. Which bank is the biggest bank in the world? Vinit is here, the first one. Uh, in terms of uh, a fund? Rep assets, assets, no market cap, assets. Uh, I think the Public Investment Fund of Saudi Arabia has... Yeah, enough. could be. Other ideas? Which one is the biggest I bank in the... Yeah, of course. ICBC. Yeah, Charlotte knows because she's Chinese. Okay. <laughs> also, yeah. So then, uh, yeah. So, Vinit, I ask this question in my class, and not a single investment banker answers the right question. No one. So, don't feel bad. 
So four out of the five biggest banks in the world by market capitalization, sorry, by, by assets, not by market cap, are Chinese. So you have in ICBC, for instance, that always comes to the EMI conference, ICBC, for instance, is in 47 countries and territories. So huge, huge and very quite global, among others in Argentina from all the places. Okay? So then, but also, and guess what? I've been studying companies from China and I didn't know this company. Um, so the biggest, I had, I taught in January a class here for the executive MBA and I had a student working for AXA. I said, which insurance is the biggest insurance in the world? AXA. I said, no. Pingan. What, what, what? I never heard of Pingan. So a very innovative insurance company using data analytics to process the claims in hours. Uh, I had a serious problem in my house in France. I called the insurance. Two months later, no answer. So uh, they, Ping An, because of data analytics, are able to process very quickly uh, this uh, claim. So Allianz, Al AXA, the traditional biggest insurance companies, not anymore. And also in, in um, construction and in engineering, you don't have any major, whether any major uh, civil construction in the world, whether it's Eastern Europe or even the train between San Francisco and uh, Los Angeles, there was this project of the train and the, 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 um, the companies that had been um, transporting Jews during the Second World War were not allowed. The idea was that Siemens would not be able to, to, to be part of this, um, of this project. But then the companies left all Chinese. The Chinese are new and all Chinese. So far, the train has not been done. If there is a train construction, a metro construction, for sure, Chinese companies will be, uh, will be bidding for the project. And also, which other one I put? There are many industries. The other are mining as well. So all this, you have no red in 2004, a lot of red in last year. Uh, Okay, so another thing that we have is that these companies, and for that, we need to study them better for that. So um, they are different from the Western counterparts. This is a fact. You like it or not like it, you agree, don't agree, they are different. One, we all know ownership. The ownership of the biggest Chinese companies is 67%, either fully or partially state-owned. We all know it's done, it's like that. Uh, however, the, uh, I lived a long time in Europe. I am from Spain, I lived a lot, a long time in France. So if you were talking about European companies, the picture would be different because in Europe, the state still has an important role. Pensions are still public in most uh, countries. Here, everything depends on the, uh, for me also, uh, not a shock, but okay, I knew, but it's different. It's too dependent, it's very dependent. I don't know if too dependent, but very dependent on the stock market. And 79% of the companies in the global 500 from the US are uh, public. A little bit different than the Chinese ones. Another very important thing, and we have done this exercise three times, we look at very high um, technological products, smartphones. How many here have an iPhone? Please raise your hands. Me too. Yeah, right on. Uh, Samsung, how many? Okay, two, Yevande, Maria. And then how many? Huawei? Oh, very good. Two here. And uh, Xiaomi, my nephew as well in Spain. And Oppo? No. Okay, so then these are the uh, smartphones more sold in the world. Number one, um, Samsung by number of units, not the most profitable. Number two, Huawei. Huawei actually with the current very, very, how do you say, very uh, not controversial, very 
uh, with current fight with the US, still is gaining market share, even now. And number three, Apple. Number four, Xiaomi. Number five, Oppo. So three out of the, uh, the one of the most technological products that we have right now, that right now laptop, um, sorry, how do you say, iPads, all these uh, oh, tablets, thank you. All tab tablets are disappearing because the phones are becoming so good that then no need to have a tablet. The phone is your tablet and then laptops. So if you look at laptops, also Lenovo, number one in the world by number of units sold. So these companies, what is uh, difficult for what we teach in business schools and also the, what we do in business schools that we say, maximize the, uh, the willingness to pay of the client. So these companies that are competing very high-tech products compete on price. They always have a product at a lower price. So you want to maximize profit, we tell our students, you have to maximize clients' willingness to pay profits and also increase shareholder value that is linked to profits. These companies still compete in very high technological products on price in most cases. Sometimes because no choice, other times, uh, other times, uh, so they have to, to gain market share, they have to first, first compete on price. And also because many of their, of their citizens don't have the high purchasing power yet. Still, China is at average $13,000 per capita. So you need to, for the Chinese market, to have a very a, a, a cheaper price uh, phone. Or the geophone in India is the same concept. So that's very disturbing. And now we see that Apple, for instance, is launching a low price smartphone. Needs to compete with them and has to, uh, has to compete on price as well. By the way, the manufacturing facilities were going to be very close to Wuhan. So they are trying to see where they put their manufacturing facilities. Another interesting thing is profits. So two things. One is that we looked at the margins of Chinese in red or blue um, US companies, the margins that they have. Consistently, the margins of Chinese companies are lower. So Chinese companies go for growth and sacrifice short-term profits, except, except for the banking sector. Why you think is that? Will I ask again another? Why you think that profits for uh, someone who was in my class cannot answer because we had an answer from Guan Alam. Uh, so why you think that the, the, the Chinese banks have higher margins than the US one? Who wants to say? Ah, thank you. Uh, is it because their regulatory costs are lower than their counterparts in the US? Regulatory costs, yeah, could be. We need here, yeah, and this lady also, yeah. Because it's China, China company owned, so they have more profit opportunities. Okay, another and we need here. So I think interest rates in US have been historically low, in Europe they are negative. Uh, but in China the interest is like uh, comparatively much higher than in Europe and US. So I think that is one of the Reason. driving factors for profits of these banks. Okay, very good. Anybody? Any other idea? We had in my class the. But one of the executive vice presidents of Bank of China, and someone asked this question to him, and he said, two reasons, salaries are low. So look at the average salary, I'll show you this in a minute. Salaries are lower, and technology. Banks are so technology heavy, intensive. And because salaries are lower, the, the development of technology for banking that is very expensive is cheaper in India. And of course, all the other reasons that you mentioned as well. But except for financial sector, so if we look at the overall, overall profits of US companies, this is Fortune Global 500, very simple. You divide revenues by profits, it's a very simple equation. So we have here overall 7.52% and the Chinese five, two percent. But in, in technology, so 20, 14 companies from US, eight from China, profits different, 
energy as well. So again, these companies um, work for growth and sacrifice profits. Okay, so this is the, the thing about uh, cost. So the cost of any product of, or service, of any product or service, the cost is a result of minimum wage, cost of energy, and cost of gasoline. So we looked at that in a number of countries, and China is still on really the cheaper side. And my opinion is that, or our opinion is that, will stay there for a while. Germany, the higher cost. Korea, very high cost. US, quite high cost. Japan as well. Brazil and Mexico, or India, could compete also with China in terms of cost. But the problem is that China has been able to integrate the globe so far. So far, we are in a very difficult moment. Uh, between US and China with all the trade dispute. Let's see what will happen later. But till now, integration of global value chain and also the logistics. Logistics are excellent done. Also, China ships the products through the Suez Canal to the Mediterranean for Europe and they have bought ports. I'm from Barcelona, my Barcelona port. Chinese investments very high. Pireo in Greece as well to enter Eastern Europe. So very high, and I put at the top the data of the highest end. So look at the average of the salary of a CEO of a US company. As you know, these salaries are being, as we speak, under the scrutiny because this is a golden era for CEOs uh, for US. So please, if you want to become CEO as soon as possible because this is going to go down. These salaries are too much. As you can see, the average is huge uh, here. And China is much more lower for various reasons, state owned, and also the pressure from the society and many other things. Also uh, against corruption campaigns. So definitely a much, much, much lower. Okay. Second thing, okay. One other thing that we have a chapter in the book is about how China is growing in a, in a number of uh, variables, and this is data from the Global Innovation Index. So the data shows that in terms of patents filed in two or more countries, in terms of investment in R&D, researchers, China is growing tremendously. And also, yeah, okay, and also regarding branding. So if you look at Brand Z or Brand Directory, the presence of Chinese companies is not there. So one thing that Chinese companies are lacking, you couldn't mention the name of the biggest bank in the world, is brand, brand recognition, that US companies are definitely champions of branding and brand recognition. Needless to say, the GAFA, Google, uh, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, tremendous, while the equivalence, Tencent has gained a lot, and, but even Baidu, Alibaba has gained a lot. So not the same as uh, US companies. Okay. And then, okay, one thing, and I think I'll finish here and I'll open for discussion. One thing that we'll also look is how Chinese companies have ventured abroad. Do they need to go abroad? They need to go abroad to learn, but not because the size of the market is so huge, they could stay local, I remember talking to a senior executive at ICBC and said, we are in almost 50 countries. Only 10% of our revenues comes from abroad. Not worth it. Too much pain for very little. Let's concentrate back in China. But definitely here you can see blue US. This is data from FDI markets. Again, I have to say thank you to Daniel who compiled the data from FDI markets, a database available here in uh, the Johnson Library. Very grateful to the library because you have wonderful databases, FDI markets, Capital IQ. Please use them because they are so excellent for our research. So then FDI markets shows that in blue. Uh, FDI markets look at greenfield investments. You know, greenfield is when you don't buy, you just open your own factory. So announced greenfield investments from US and China. 
And here, yes, you see, you see the change much later, like 2012, 2013, when companies invest abroad a lot. We looked at the names of the companies, and Huawei is, I think, number seven in China, if I remember correctly, by Greenfield Investments Abroad. So very, very aggressively moving abroad. In terms of M&A, in terms of Greenfield, it's, uh, interestingly enough, US investments invest the most in China. China announced Greenfield investments invest the most in Indonesia and then the US. In m and if we look at individual countries, China invests the most in mergers and acquisitions in, in the US. But if we look at the region, Europe invests the most. It came as a surprise to me, but that's the data from Capital IQ. Another very interesting fact is that while US companies are investing abroad because of efficiency seeking or market seeking to because they have the best algorithm or the best competitive advantage. Chinese companies, they are looking for natural resources, but mainly to learn, to learn and to become better companies in that way, becoming also better at home. Okay, maybe this one will skip it. Okay, so one, and that's the last thing we do. We have one chapter for each of these companies. So we don't want to know only the general panorama, but we looked at a bank that I mentioned a number of times, ICBC. We look at a State Grid, a very interesting company, completely state-owned, investing a lot all over the world, mainly in Brazil. So again, when I ask my students which one is the biggest electricity power company in the world, no one will mention State Grid Corporation of China. And this company has a very interesting uh, innovation is the company that has, um, has um, implemented high voltage in the transmission lines. And by doing the high voltage, they lose less electricity in transmission than other companies. And that's, that, that's, way, that's, why, that's why they integrate different, different uh, sources of energy, hydro, solar, nuclear, wind, and they can leverage when one is more or another. And their, um, their goal is to create, like we have World Wide Web, so an electricity wide web in the world. And then Tencent, an innovative tech giant with WeChat and responsible with Alipay and WeChat Pay the, um, behind this tremendous growth in mobile payments in China. In Hainan Airlines, we wanted to also put a, what was a successful conglomerate and now has become a much difficult one for a number of reasons, one too many acquisitions. And we wanted to also not only say, okay, all companies are doing extremely well, there are successes and failures. In Hainan, the final fate is not clear, but definitely is a company that is suffering because they bought too much, too fast, um, the Palisades were, uh, were Johnson till now, actually, till this year, was um, having the executive MBA classes, Palisades, outside New York, was, is still owned by Hainan Airlines. To give you an example of how much they expanded buying real estate everywhere, uh, hotels, uh, convention centers, etc. Okay, just to, to, for a comparison, a state grid, 370 billion, in revenues compared to the next biggest, the Italian NL, the French EDF, or the Japanese T TEPCO. Okay? Okay, and then that's the final point. So number one, what a, connecting to the beginning, these companies have grown because the scale of the market, because of the growth of the economy, and because the capacity to absorb knowledge. Definitely these have been the three main drivers. And then I'm going to start with this one, with the lower thing. Competition will continue. These companies compete. I'm going to give you an example. China Mobile, the biggest company, mobile, uh, the biggest telecom company in the world by revenues and by also uh, uh, stock market value. This company, very local. Now there is uh, auctioning OI, one of the companies in Brazil. In China Mobile has said, I want to buy it. 
the competitors, Spanish Telefonica, Mexican America Mobile, Italian team that are there, or AT&T that is also expanding in Latin America, no, they don't have the capacity today to buy it. The Chinese companies continue to have this capacity to buy and will continue buying and expanding and offering very competitive lower prices in many of their products. So if China Mobile's China Mobile enters the telecom sector in Brazil will be a tremendous shakeup because the other companies are not used to compete on lower prices. Then another thing, and we haven't emphasized this enough, is that these companies go for the long term. And now we are used and we tell, in, again, in our business schools, short-term value, shorter shareholder value, quarter results. This, there is pressure as we speak for forgetting about the quarter results and going to more into the medium and long term, but these companies go for the long term. And on the positive side, they are sources of knowledge and innovation. They are not copycats anymore. And they are an opportunity of jobs. Some of you, uh, some of alumni are working for Tencent. The head of Tencent in Mexico is a Johnson alum. They are recruiting also for their offices in Silicon Valley. To give you an example, there are many more in a source of learning and we should focus much more on them in the business schools programs. And that's the final thought being in Johnson, in my school, in a business school. So thank you very much. Questions, you need to use the microphone because we are on Zoom. Thank you, Lourdes, I really appreciate it. Um, I wanted to ask more about the brand name recognition of Chinese companies. Um, in the past year or two, a uh, social media app called TikTok mm, has yeah, taken yeah, over yeah. and um, like there's been a lot of controversy also with it, with privacy issues, with um, other companies bringing um, their own apps like Triller to combat or just like promoting those um, other apps to combat them. So how do you feel about um, Chinese companies that are like coming here and doing their thing but um, people who are just trying to like capitalize off of their um, off of their growth, so they won't grow even more. Um, how do you think that Chinese companies can combat that? Yeah, with the xenophobia and negative mm. thoughts that can happen with um, with certain groups. Okay, why don't we take maybe two three questions and then okay, I'll write it down, and then I'll answer. Yeah, more questions. Uh, thank you, Lourdes, for the amazing presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so my question is regarding that you mentioned that uh, Chinese companies can compete a lot because uh, they have competitive strategies, but we can see that uh, like in case of UI, like they are sponsored, uh, a large part of them is sponsored by the Chinese government. And as more and more companies are moving into Fortune 500 buckets, what do you think, is it, is it a sustainable way to grow? in the next decade because as the economy grows, as the companies grow, mm -hmm. uh, will the government of China will be able to provide that kind of support to these big giants like you? Very good. And one more over there. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I actually have two questions. My first one is also related to um, the branding. You mentioned that uh, Chinese companies lack like branding, mm -hmm. but like do these companies really care about branding at this stage or mm. the type of these companies do they care? Because you mentioned like they're mostly like seeking for knowledge and like com competing for natural resources. So I'm wondering about that. And the second question is about like you mentioned a lot about Chinese companies investments in Latin America. Mm. So what are like Latin American governments like policies towards like Definitely. Chinese companies occupying the markets, mm. I guess. Thank you. Very good. Okay, uh, maybe I'll start with the last one. Easy, very easy. <laughs> okay, so Latin America saw for a while the Chinese investments as the holy grail. My God, the China will ha has this appetite for natural resources. They were pushing the natural resources, uh, the prices higher. So the golden decade of Latin America in the 2000s was due in part to the Chinese investments. And also they were seen like, okay, you know what? They don't come here to colonize us. They will be nicer to us. That was the attitude. They are like peers. 
at that time, probably the Latin America, yeah, at, that, at the beginning, 2004, 2005, the, the, the size of Latin America was 6 trillion, the size of China, 6 trillion. So these guys are coming because they need natural resources, but they won't do us any harm. And now, the attitude is the opposite. The attitude is that they come, they take the natural resources, and they leave. They compete. Uh, okay, most of the of the exports to so Brazil is one of the few countries in the world with a with a trade surplus with China. But this is due to soya, iron ore, and basically still uh, commodities. So the, the the investment and the increase in trade is not seen beneficial. Okay, so I'm going to ask you another question. Has, in the darker years of China, did any of us help China? No way. So then why they are going to come and help us? China is 1.5 billion citizens, so the government has enough to take care of the citizens. So I would say one the the the, 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 the more uh, um, attitude very against China right now, or the other one that was seen as mana as is going to be this is going to solve all our problems is something in the middle. China likes to negotiate, has to negotiate. So please sit China in the table and say, okay, you take this from me, take this one from me. So uh, China, why China is going to save Brazilian citizens? First, China will say will save Chinese citizens, which is normal. So neither or. So does the attitude has changed? But again, uh, again, probably the, the 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 truth is in the middle. That's one thing. Second thing regarding brand, going at the whole thing of brand. Brand again is the holy grail, if I can repeat the word, of any business. If you have a brand like Apple, you can charge. Okay, I am an Apple user for many many years. Don't. I think it is videotape. I hope the Apple doesn't complain. <laughs> no, what I am saying is that Apple is able to charge much more. I want to change. I have the latest A4 iPhone because I was behind. And now my telecom operator had a, a, a very good deal. And I said, OK, time to change. Good camera. So I go to the shop here in Triphammer. And the lady said, don't change. It's not good. It's just the camera. It's the same. I said, oh my God. I mean, really incredible. No? So an iPhone is still able to overcharge for a phone. Which phone is better, Samsung, Huawei, or Apple? More and more quite similar. No? So now the last camera of iPhone is not bad. But uh, so which one is better again? So Samsung tends to be, as of late, the first one now again is launching this folding phone with the best camera ever, the latest, the latest Galaxy, they say it's really out of this world. So, however, still these guys, because of the powerful brand, this genius that was Steve Jobs, and a lot of innovation that went in simplicity and beautiful design that went into Apple, was able to charge. So yes, Chinese companies want that. And I, I was in, in Monterrey. I landed in Monterrey in the airport. I thought, what is this? Huawei shop or in the, the or in the middle in Dubai. And uh, also in you know, Dubai or Abu Dhabi have a beautiful shop. So Huawei is copying in Xiaomi. Even the founders of Xiaomi, the way they launch the phones, they copy a Steve Jobs. So yes, Chinese companies want to add brand. Definitely. And they say, you know, they say sometimes there is nothing, there is no bad publicity. Any publicity is good. So many of you have never heard of Huawei, and now you are intrigued sometimes by the brand. So uh, yes, Huawei is one that has gone a little bit beyond. And for instance, Tencent, my nephew is completely addicted to video games, unfortunately. And he plays this League of Legends and all of them. And at some point, so Sometimes I've seen the video games, all owned by Tencent, many of them owned by Tencent, not all, but many. So Tencent was nowhere to be seen. So now Tencent has started putting, because WeChat, yes, okay, WeChat has not been able to occupy the space that WhatsApp or uh, here you use GroupMe, 
no, has not been able to occupy that international space and would like to occupy that space. So definitely, yes, uh, Chinese companies are learning, as I said, are positioning themselves. Lenovo, again, Lenovo bought the brand from IBM. And now you go anywhere and you see Lenovo, Lenovo, Lenovo everywhere. It's number one in, in terms of number of units of laptops sold. So yes, uh, brands they want. And then the last question was, okay. Yeah, your question, I started, okay. So what uh, Vinit was asking is that, Will this stake, will this, uh, okay, so here we are speculating, but will this um, ownership model will continue? So my opinion is that for the moment will continue because now China is facing headwinds both in America, US, so China needs to be united. And guess what? There is a tremendous consensus, so surveys show again and again that Chinese prefer this situation in which both the government, the private sector, the academia work together very closely. That's what they want because it has worked. It has worked and in, ta in, in times in which, and, and now with a terrible epidemic even more, so you need to work together. And for me, the model will continue for, I don't know, 10 years, I would say, at least. And then we'll see where, in which world we are. And we see now here in the, in the US also that the government has a, a more important role within the business sector. They give opinion, they say you have to do this, and, and companies, you know, you all have no choice, you have to follow. Okay, more questions? Ah, okay, very good. Oh, okay, yeah. Um, yeah. The Belt and Road Initiative, what impact do you think that will have on? The um, development of Chinese companies. Very good. Yeah. Another question. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Well, well road. Very good questions. Um, I'd just like to push uh, uh, the previously asked question a little bit further. Um, what impact does the nature of Chinese companies, which are primarily backed by, um, you know. Government support first and second, mm -hmm. a lot of international demand. Um, this model, what does that, what impact would it have on the competitiveness mm -hmm. of these firms with respect to other Western companies that they're competing mm -hmm. against? Very good. One last, okay, over there. So now more and more Chinese companies are occupying the, um, the top of the list and but for example in business schools we have rarely touched on the mm -hmm. different management styles of Chinese companies do you have you ever have you seen like practices of Western companies which are learning from the management style of Chinese mm -hmm. companies okay so uh, a couple of things so as I said first of all okay actually my institute my institute was funded we celebrate 10th anniversary this year we just had a meeting the EMI team, where we are preparing this, uh, this anniversary. So, and it was funded by alum who had worked uh, over in Hong Kong, in China, in Southeast Asia, Brazil, all over the world, with the idea that, as you are saying, business schools, not this one, all over the world, a business school in Brazil will study, USP, FGV, will study the same case studies that we study here at Johnson. Sometimes I have uh, exchange students, CKGSB, we have exchange students from CKGSB. We ask her, which uh, cases are you studying in class? Okay, which cases are you studying in, in your class, in your daily class? Yeah, which cases? Ah, well, very good. Yeah, so then, yes, more Chinese content. But in general, business schools are mainly studying uh, U.S. companies because so far they have had the best, uh, they have been the best in terms of management. Processes are very, very important, very important. I remember uh, it's part also of the American psyche. I was coming from another business school in France, in INSEAD, and for one of the things I had, okay, we are going to organize an event. 
here. So I would meet, I would meet the event organizer and we would go again and again and again through the process. He said, okay, we'll do it, that's it. It will go well, it's a party, it will go well. No, everything had to be very well organized. It's part of the American psyche and part of the American leadership. So then, yes, we have to study American companies because have been the teachers of the world of, in terms of business. But again, as you are saying, we are seeing that many, again, insurance, Ping An, by the way, the preface of the book was written by Jessica Tan, who is the co-CEO of Ping An. And I discussed a lot with them about the, their practices. For me, if you look at insurance, you should look at Ping An because they have excellent data analytics, as I said before, and excellent innovation that could be a good example, a good shakeup for the traditional access and alliance of this world. So yes, we should study more uh, more diversified companies, not only US, but China, because China is at the top, and also others, Japan. Uh, and, but again, let me just tell you another thing, a disclaimer. So the, the understanding was, Fukuyama, the end of the history, the understanding was that all different systems of management would converge to the best one, that was the US. So what was the point of studying that, yes, Japanese do things a little bit different, Latin American companies are huge conglomerates, why to study them? They are all going to die. They are going to all go to the typical publicly quoted uh, US company in terms of ownership, in terms of management, and salaries, okay, as you can see, the more the merrier. So we should, and that's the, in what I said at the end, we should in business schools learn more about this, for instance, Tencent. Facebook, they rely on marketing. Tencent, they rely now on a diversified, completely diversified source of income. Now mobile payments, tremendous, very good source of income, but also through the video games, they, they, they sell all these small things related to the video game. So that's a very sure marketing, marketing, um, Revenues are come up and down, up and down. These are sure. So they have created some kind of ecosystem with a very diversified and connected at the same time source of revenue. So Tencent, very interesting. I was in the in uh, one consulting class here in Johnson and he was predicting the faculty that Tencent has the most sustainable business model and we should compare to Facebook or even Google. So that we should study. So definitely, yes. The uh, market complexity, I'll answer the last, and BRI, so the Belt and Road Initiative. So China, with the Belt and Road Initiative, what they are uh, doing from a political point of view, I avoid politics in my presentation and in my book, but from a political point of view, they are creating a zone of influence. And what we see in terms of investments is that the investments that used to go to Europe and US are being diverted from a very low point of view, and here we have Michael Cochres, one student who is, yeah, Michael did a very good study on the Belt and Road Initiative. He's a specialist, and you can talk much more with him. He's a work in progress, a work in progress, because he's very, uh, it's, it's relatively new, it's just five years initiative. But we see an increase of investments from China of 50% in the last five years compared to a certain reduction in uh, other areas like Europe and US where they face headwinds. It's a lot of scrutiny. The CFUS committee has grown to look very carefully to every single, uh, every single acquisition of Chinese companies here in the US. While in the BRI is an open field, is they are uh, markets that are developing, so then they are moving into that. And then the uh, question about market and competition, that's a difficult one. Strangely enough, China is one of the most competitive countries. Very competitive. Companies are born and die very quickly. Uh, Chinese consumers are more and more sophisticated. So strangely enough, very often, yes, state grid has a lot of government support. It's a state-owned company. 
and has to have support from the government because China had zero electrification, no electricity. So they had to build the elect electricity is the key industry, is the key one. We don't have electricity, we don't have anything. So yes, the government followed very closely because they had targets on the, the electricity had to arrive everywhere and no power cuts, no nothing, extremely well done. So had to follow that this, this very directly. But at the same time in consumer products, in uh, services, there is a very fierce competition at the same time. So it's a contradiction because you say state-owned, you think of monopolies that are not innovative, that are, no. We see that at the same time. And so far, guess what? It has worked. So then why to change? As I said before, because your question is a little bit related to what we need to ask before. More questions, comments? What, till what time we have, or are we beyond the time? Other five minutes? Or, yeah? Yeah, any questions or comments to the presentation? Yeah? Charlotte? Two, three? All right, thank you so much for sharing, which I found very valuable for me. Mm -hmm. And I really want to ask a question, mm -hmm. a, um, the most hated issue recently, mm -hmm. the Corona virus. Uh, yeah. So as you know, as a, a systematic risk for the multinational Chinese companies, do they think that it will affect their investment behaviors in the long run? Like they may shift their focus from the domestic market to a more like global market and mm. will they prefer M&A mm. instead of starting from scratch? Mm. I wrote, I was asked to write an article about this. <laughs> so I wrote an article about coronavirus. Okay, so everybody extrapolates the data that we have from SARS, from the previous epidemic in 2004. I did the same. So if we extrapolate from that data, okay, so two things happened at that time. One is that rebound was very fast, so we shouldn't worry. This is a non-event. That's what they say from SARS. So SARS um, was uh, heavy on China, so China lost 1% of economic growth before of SARS, and the rest of the world lost between 0.2 and 0.3%. But what I say in the article, okay, number one, it would seem that the number of cases that get it is going down. So are we already at the peak and we'll go like that and down? We don't know that. Others say the peak will be April, May. That's very important for us because EMI is hosting an academic conference, May 13, 15, and it's an academic conference that rotates. Last year was UT Dallas, and almost half of the scholars were from China. So I get all, all the time, my colleague at Wuhan, will you be able to come? And she says, yes, we'll be able to come. The tremendous effort, the heroic effort of all the citizens of Wuhan and China and all the help we are getting, we are going to overcome, and I'll be in Ithaca in the conference, hopefully so. So we don't know that, it's still too early. What is true is that two things. One is that uh, number one, the uh, values in the stock markets are very, very high. So people are, is this going to be, look, I, if I look at the, 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 what is the name, the Bloomberg uh, talks again. So the, risk, the disruption of the coronavirus will be long lasting. So it's too early to say, uh, hopefully it will rebound quickly. But the problem is that the integration of the value chain, number one, so how the, for instance, as I said before, the Apple cheaper phone was supposed to be manufactured in Wuhan, close to Wuhan, so now they are looking for another location because they would like to start as soon as possible. Companies have normally between 30 to 45 days of supplies coming from China. They have this buffer in case something happens. So as you know, today, tomorrow, yesterday, most of the uh, businesses were starting to work again. They are doing it in a, in a escalating, not, not all at once, how do you say? Staggered way to avoid problems. And then also the people, the workers will have different, different schedules so that rush hour is not at the same time so that the risk of contagion goes down. So I think in the next days, in the next week or two weeks, we will see if number one is true that the number of infected cases is go are going down. 
Second, if the going back to work is able to be smooth and everything works well, in which case we shouldn't see that much disruption all over the world. If you look, Walmart is responsible for 10% of the overall imports from China. So if you see, go to Walmart and you see that some of the products are missing, meaning means that the value, the, the, the value chain is being disrupted. So it's work in progress, more news the next two or three weeks. Yeah, Judith, you don't want to ask anything? Judith knows the book better than me, so that's why. <laughs> we have discussed a lot about that. Yeah. Ah, okay. What are you optimistic about? What are you pessimistic about? <laughs> okay, so a couple of things. Um, I think we discussed this before the presentation. Uh, I'm optimistic about China. I think China has reached a point in which uh, the growth will continue. Um, it's causing disruption, but I think China is aware that the least disruption possible, the better, because China, part of the growth in China, also depends on the growth of the rest of the world. So, uh, and in terms, okay, I discussed this thing about the trade war in my class. In, about half the class was in favor, so about half the class in favor of the trade war and half, uh, half against. My opinion is that it's better to negotiate. They are both very, okay, not at the same level. China, uh, US is 70, 17 trillion economy and nominal uh, China 13 trillion, still behind. But they are very powerful, so it's better to find these agreements. To negotiate with them, okay, you do this, I do this, so give and take and, and find harmonious a solution. That's my opinion. I I won't give a. Do I agree? Do I disagree with China? I see the facts, and based on the facts, I believe that. The last one. Yeah. Thank you.